those things. When the armies of the Crusaders come to Jerusalem, the Muslims look at the Jews and they say, you've been living here for hundreds of years under our rule. Again, I know that you're, you're, you're not the, the big shots in town, but you have, you have neighborhoods, you've had children, you have grandchildren, your families are here, you have businesses here. Take up arms and join us in repelling these crusaders. And in essence, Jews and Muslims fought together against the invaders of the crusades. It's complex. History is not a black and white sort of issue. No one is all good and all bad. These are complex things. You're dealing primarily with individuals who did not have spiritual motivation in all of these things, but had bloodlust often. And so Muslims did terrible things. In return, people from the West did terrible things. Muslims did terrible things. And, and the cycle is endless because the cycle of sin is endless. And so just to have our eyes open about that sort of thing. As we said, there are different Muslim rulers, and oftentimes these Muslim rulers have their power base in certain physical locations. Uh, the Mamluks came out of Egypt, and they took the land from different Muslims. Mamluks were really good at building stuff. And they, there, there are walls in and around Jerusalem and buildings that are Mameluk uh, construction that are 700 years old and are just as strong today as they were when they were built. Uh, they got to rule for a couple of hundred years. Then from the north, the Ottoman Turks come down out of Turkey over here. They come down into the Middle East, and they are very fierce. They defeat the Mameluks, and they set up their own system. And a lot of the, again, a lot of the buildings, the walls that you see around Jerusalem today are Ottoman Empire. The Ottoman Empire is the greater Turkish Empire. It's not just Turkey, it's a lot of the land that they conquered. Okay. Within Judaism at this time, Judaism in some places is flourishing. In Spain, Judaism is flourishing. They're doing well. They are growing. They're having kids. They're having big families. They are writing uh, Sefer Torahs. They are promoting amongst their own people uh, loyalty to the God of Israel. Uh, there are a number of things that arise during this time. The Karite movement is a movement within Judaism that pops up around the year 5, 6, 700 AD it were its beginnings. The Talmud is completed 5, 6, 700 AD. Talmud is completed around the year 550. The, a group of Jews look at the Talmud and they said, this is nonsense. All these debates and rules and regulations that you rabbis have tried to impose, we're Bible people. Let's go back to the Torah. Let's see what Moshe Rabbeinu says. And we're only going to obey his words and the words of the prophets. We don't accept your later additions. The Karite movement rejected Talmud. It became a very powerful movement, both in the Middle East and into Europe. The Karite movement spread into Europe. There were gigantic synagogues in Poland, in Romania, across Eastern Europe that were Karite synagogues. Ultimately, they were persecuted. People didn't want to intermarry with them. And ultimately, it was a movement that became very weak. Again, we, we could go into much more detail, but that will suffice for, for now. Uh, during this time period, the Masoretes, we had mentioned and referenced them Previously, the Masoretes are a group of Jewish scholars who are writing in Tiberias. They are residing there. They are desirous of preserving the text of the scripture. And we had uh, mentioned this before. I had a, a lower quality uh, overhead for that. But here, as an illustration, on the left is a Torah scroll. This is a portion of a Torah scroll. Um, and you'll see here a line. Right here, you'll see a line. Um, basically, that line is scratched and etched out on a piece of cloth. Cloth is the outer layer of the skin of a kosher animal. So that's been stretched. It's been treated. 
they then take a, a kind of a metal jig that has sharp edges, evenly spaced, and they'll wet the cloth, they'll wet the skin, and with great pressure, they'll pull it down and across the cloth, creating this indentation, this line. And then as they write the Torah scroll, the letters of a Torah scroll hang from underneath the line. Letters of a Torah scroll are not written on top of the line. They hang underneath the line. And depending upon the edition, the columns are such and such a length wide. The pieces of each um, piece of skin are cut in rectangles. The columns are filled up, and then ultimately they are sewn together. I showed the I'm generally I'm I've been I do this at 8:30. At 9:45, I run over to the other building and basically reteach the kids the same thing. Uh, but we have all kinds of silly kitty videos that illustrate this. So we had a video by, from Australia, by the way, of, of a, an Orthodox Jewish kid, some 14-year-old kid, and he goes to visit a sofer, stam, a, a fellow who writes out Torah scrolls. And he's illustrating how this is done. He takes a quill pen, writes out the letters. However, the illustration here is to show an original Torah scroll on your left-hand side. On your right, you have the current Hebrew text as it appears in a standard Masoretic text. So if, you've, if any of you have gone to Christian Bible College, a Christian seminary, or if you have simply studied Bible in a Jewish setting, generally what you need is a Hebrew text with the vowel points. This has no vowel points, Torah scroll letters, there's no vowels here, whereas with the Masoretic text, the Masoretic uh, scholars understood that, for instance, um, the word holech, we had used that as an illustration the other day, the, the, the Hebrew root there, that three-letter root of holech, which means to either to go or to walk, that it can be done in various ways. I am walking, holech, halachti, I walked, or I went someplace. I will walk, she will walk, we are walking now. Uh, and so all of these things are not in a Torah scroll, for the most part, unless the letter is a consonant. Obviously a nun for, few, for you know, uh, plural action is a consonant, so it's there. But other vowels that the Masoretic scribes understood from common use, they're not in the original Hebrew text. So the Masoretes invent a system of dots and dashes. No, it's not Morse code. It is the Masoretic text. And from that, it tells you whether to pronounce something as holech or halach. It will tell you uh, what the action is. It will oftentimes give the emphasis, is something imperative, is it uh, passive, is it past tense, all of those sort of things. And so vowels can be under a letter, they can be beside a letter, like a cholom, or they can be above the letters. Um, it is actually one of the simpler languages to learn. My wife and I uh, used to team teach uh, Hebrew in our Messianic congregation. We had a mid-sized Messianic congregation. And uh, I would teach beginner Hebrew. She would teach intermediate. Not because she knew more, but because she's much more disciplined than I am. And by the time the kids get to intermediate Hebrew, they are 11 and 12, and they've got to get serious because bar or bat mitzvah is around the corner. And so she was no nonsense. Whereas I just loved the little kids and... Uh, so we had fun learning Aleph Beit, and we started at age eight, uh, and just 45 minutes once a week is all we had them. This was before all the helps they have on the internet today. It's not difficult to learn to read this. Reading it correctly is one thing. Understanding what you're reading is another. There are legions of bar mitzvah boys and girls, bar bat mitzvah kids, 
who can read the text on the right-hand side perfectly have almost no idea what they're saying. Why? Because the moment of truth is when they ascend to the bima on the day of their, the Saturday morning of their bar bat mitzvah, everyone in the synagogue is listening to how they pronounce the Hebrew. A rabbi is standing here, and he's like whispering, you know, no, that's a chirik. You need to say e. And he's kind of making sure the kid doesn't make big mistakes. Different synagogues have different levels of threshold. What, what type of mistake the kid is allowed to make before the rabbi corrects him? And I've actually been in the position of standing here during a bar bat mitzvah. And I'm, not, I'm no expert whatsoever, but some kids do a great job, and other kids just barely get through. We drew the line. No one had a cheat sheet in front of them with the Hebrew in uh, transliteration English characters. Many reform synagogues allow that. <laughs> so there is the text. During this time, there are attempts to codify Judaism and to kind of create a systematic theology of Judaism. Because as soon as you take a look at the Talmud, you, you say, how in the world can any one person ever understand that? And the answer is, no one person can. That's why you have these career Talmud students who do nothing but study Talmud, and still they argue with one another. And so there are now attempts to codify the, um, the faith of Judaism. Uh, there are uh, uh, codifications like the Shulchan Aruch. Shulchan Aruch is uh, essentially, a, a, would be translated as a, a, an ordered table, a table that was put in order, Shulchan Aruch. Um, Maimonides comes on the scene, and uh, he's writing in Europe, he's writing in Spain, he's writing in a few other places, and he is known as the Rambam. Uh, Maimonides, he has three names, either Maimonides or Mo Moses bin Maimon, or the Rambam is what you'll often most hear in rabbinical circles. He comes up with 13 principles of faith which are generally universally accepted. And his 13 principles, the existence of God, God's unity, God's spirituality, in corporality, that he has no body. If you look at these very closely, it's not difficult to see that this is not so much a codification of Judaism, but rather it's a reaction against Christendom. That's mostly what it is. Because, for instance, number three, that there is no corporal body to God. Well, they're looking at images that they see on the outside of churches of the body of Jesus. They're looking at crucifixes with a body of a man hanging, and they are repulsed. God doesn't have a body, and so they need to put that down in doctrinal form, saying that he is incorporeal. We worship a God who is spirit. So God's eternal nature, God alone should be the object of worship. Again, they saw people bowing down to these, these crucifixes. Once again, they're horrified. And so the 13 principles of Maimonides are much more a reaction against the abuses and the going off of the, of the rails of Roman Catholicism. Much more they are that than they are an attempt to systematize the Jewish faith. Um, oftentimes, uh, during the 17 years I served as Messianic rabbi at our congregation, and even now, five years after stepping out of that role, I'm called upon to officiate at Jewish funerals. Um, I, I do weddings, I do funerals, I do bar mitzvahs, I don't do brises. <laughs> and so, on, on five or six occasions, I've been asked by a Jewish believer to officiate the funeral of their parent who has, to our knowledge, never made a profession of faith. But I'm, I do very well schmoozing with, with parents. And during the time that I got to know their children, I got to know them. And some of them, four or five of them, I, when I pass, make sure Muttel does my funeral. He's going to bring the Yiddishkeit. <laughs> and so that's, 
I find myself, I have found myself on three occasions in Orthodox, well, there's only one type of funeral, Jewish funeral home. They're all, they all purport to be Orthodox. Three occasions I found myself in Jewish funeral homes conducting a funeral for a person who had never made a profession of faith. Scattered in the first few rows are some Jewish believers and other believers who are there to support the family. Everyone knows who I am. What do I do? I talk about two things that are amongst the principles that Maimonides. I say, you all know of our great sage, Rambam. Here are two things the Rambam said. This is what I'll always have in my message. The Rambam said, Anim hamim be'imuna biviyat hamashiach. I believe with perfect, complete faith, biviyat hamashiach, in the coming of the Messiah. And if he should tarry, I will wait for him until he comes. I'll quote it all in Hebrew, and then I'll say it in English. And I'll say that's the 12th principle of Maimonides. I believe with perfect faith in the coming of the Mashiach. And then the last principle, he says, Ani mahamim be'imuna shlema, in the in the resurrection, I believe with perfect faith in the resurrection of the dead and that the matim, the dead, will have eternal souls. Then I bring those two together and I say, the coming of the Messiah ultimately was to allow our souls. And they know who I am. I say, for those of us who are Messianic Jewish, we understand that this was the role of Messiah Yeshua. I say the Y word. <laughs> And people tighten up, okay, but they knew that was coming. Uh, and we talk about the fact that our faith is not a departure from biblical Jewish principles. Again, Maimonides found it necessary to try to thwart the influence of Roman Catholicism. But when he was biblical, as in points 12 and 13, we say, yea and amen, and we embrace it, and we can use it. And this is the principle that we see in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 20, where Paul, who calls himself a Hebrew of Hebrews, of the tribe of Benjamin, circumcised the eighth day, as to the law, blameless. This Paul, who was from the diaspora, he wasn't like the Jews of Jerusalem, he would say in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 20, to the Judeans, I became as a Judean that I might win the Judeans. To those under the law, I became as under the law, though I am not under the law. Become all things to all men that I might win some. So Paul had no problem adopting the outward appearance, the mannerisms, the knowledge of those in Judea. He wasn't insecure in his Jewishness. That wasn't the issue. He didn't want there to be any barrier between their considering, honestly, the person and the messiahship of Yeshua. That, to him, was the issue. And that's a uh, principle that all those who are effective in Jewish ministry will continue to practice today. It is not simply an evangelistic strategy, but it really should be who we are as people. So it's not being duplicitous, but it really should be part of our DNA as believers. At this point, the Jews are being tossed about, the Jewish communities are being tossed about by changes in Europe. The, the Muslims start to fade and they start to lose power, and eventually the armies from Central Europe are able to push the, the Muslims out of Spain. And now the Jews in Spain are under threat. So there is a radical shifting around of relationships. There are periodic outbreaks of persecution in areas where Roman Catholic rulers prevail. Again, it varies. Please don't paint this with a broad brush and say Jewish life under Roman Catholicism was always horrible. 
It wasn't. There were many times and many locations where for two or three generations, they built homes, they had businesses, they, everyone met in the marketplace. Like you see there in the movie Footer on the Roof, everyone would come together and they would meet there and they did their com commerce. Usually on a Thursday was market day. So there were disputations with the Catholic Church. There were some areas where the municipal government and the Catholic Church were indistinguishable. And in those areas, they could force the Jewish rabbis of the area to come at a certain time to the public square and engage in debates. We have records of some of these debates in literature where Roman Catholic scholars would say, you know, bring your best scholars, and if you don't, we're going to come looking for them, and we're going to set up a table in the square of the city, and we're going to have a debate. And we're going to talk about whether our religion is true or whether your religion is true. And so there were all kinds of, uh, of results to these. Sometimes the Roman Catholic scholars knew very little. They misunderstood Judaism completely, and they were made to look foolish by some of the Jewish rabbis. At other times, the Roman Catholic scholars had done their homework. They actually were able to read and translate the Hebrew, and they understandably pointed out all the messianic prophecies. And to these, oftentimes the rabbis did not have a good response. It varied. Again, avoid the temptation of oversimplifying. Steve, uh, last evening, cautioned us against some of the things we see on the internet today with things just being painted with a broad brush and facts being thrown out the window in favor of, of these cute graphics that pop up on our screens. And the graphics are, as time goes on, moderation is disappearing, facts are disappearing, and you're finding more and more people being pulled to the extreme. And that's really um, a shame because it destroys our testimony. We are here to lift up the Messiah, not to lift up any particular uh, political party or candidate. That being said, I'm well aware that in certain, certain countries, certain political parties tend to support biblical morality in a greater way. Um, I read about the races in Australia, and New Zealand, and England particularly. There's a big issue right now. And so, yes, I have an interest in who's going to be, and the fact that uh, Mr. Boris Johnson was just elected, uh, not elected, he just became uh, the prime minister, I see that as a positive thing for a number of reasons. So it's not as though we're immune. We don't regard politics as being, you know, some plague that we can't touch. But we understand that there are priorities. The good news of the arrival of Messiah is good news for everyone. It's good news for people who are considering themselves moralistic and lived moral lives. It's good news for people who have lived their entire lives in rebellion to God and are now suffering for, for it. There are people who have recognized that in their depravity, in the worst depravity known to mankind, and before they die, they've come to embrace the Messiah. So we're going to pick this up in our next session as we talk about the expulsion of our Jewish people from Europe as a result, they went, some went east, some went west, and that's why a number of you are here. That's where we'll pick it up. Thank you.